So the confusing thing about the climate crisis is that it looks very different depending on who you are and where you live. If you're a farmer in Niger, you've been experiencing droughts, and you can't grow the food you depend on, and you're going hungry. If you're a resident of Kiribati, that's a nation island in the central Pacific Ocean, you've been experiencing floods, and you may have had to rebuild your home multiple times throughout your life. And if you're me, a city boy who lives between London and Paris, well, I just binged Squid Game like nothing ever happened. The crucial thing to remember about the climate crisis is that while it's primarily caused by the most powerful and richest people in the world, the ones who feel its devastating effects are first and foremost the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world. And while, like I said, those effects look different for different people, what they all have in common is that they cause suffering. When you can't grow the food you depend on, you suffer. When your home goes underwater, you suffer. And when you're desperately waiting for season two of Squid Game to come out, <sighs> yeah, I think I'm the one who's really suffering here. What I'm saying is that the climate crisis matters because individuals matter. Their suffering matters to them, and therefore it matters to me. Now, this might seem obvious, but it's not. Because for me, at least, when I first started learning about the climate crisis, I talk a lot about it in terms of what is happening to the planet. I talk about greenhouse gas emissions and rising temperatures and melting glaciers, as if those things were the problem. And don't get me wrong, they are problems. In fact, they're very important and urgent problems. But what wasn't clear to me back then was that those things are problems not because they're inherently bad things, but because they lead to the suffering of individuals. Right, the way to think about it is, imagine for a second that the climate was drastically changing, but on a different planet, like Venus or Jupiter. Would you care? No, because no one is there to suffer the consequences of that change. Now, when it comes to humans, we have this under control. We understand that if we don't address the climate crisis, more people will suffer. And that's why today, for the rest of my time here, I'd like to talk about other animals. Because when it comes to them, this perspective, the individual's perspective, is one that's sometimes missing from the conversation. And I think that's a really bad thing, because that could unintentionally lead us to hurt a lot of animals. Let me explain what I mean. In 2014, Christine Figner was a PhD student doing conservation work on sea turtles. She was on a boat off the coast of Costa Rica when she met a sea turtle. Now, this was normal stuff for her. That's what she was there to do. But what set this encounter apart is that she noticed that this particular sea turtle had a thing stuck inside his nose. Now, she didn't know what it was. Her team didn't know what it was. But determined to help, they decided to pull it out. Her teammate grabbed a pair of pliers. She grabbed a camera to film the whole thing, and they got to work. Now, as they started pulling and tugging on this thing, it was apparent that it was a very painful experience for the turtle. He would shut his eyes real tight and struggle to get away. And no wonder, as they got about a third of the way through, the team gasped in horror as they realized, oh my goodness, this thing is a freaking worm. Now, determined to get the rest of it out, they keep going, and it keeps getting more and more painful for the turtle. Now he's screaming in pain, and blood is pouring out of his nostril. Now, finally, this whole operation lasted like eight minutes, they managed to pull the entire thing out. And when they do, that's when their disgust turns into anger as they realized that they had been fooled. This thing was not a worm. It was, in fact, a full-length disposable plastic straw. Now, I know this is not technically a climate crisis story, but it's one about our impact on the environment and how it affects other animals. And when it comes to this issue, this is the kind of thing that comes to mind. I think about a sea turtle who has to live with a plastic straw stuck in his nose, or a koala burning alive in an Australian bushfire, or a lone polar bear starving in the Arctic. In other words, I picture individuals suffering, and that's what seems to matter. Now again, this might seem obvious, but it's not. Because while we may picture these individuals, when we think about the issue, when we talk about it, we often use terms like species extinction, biodiversity, and ecosystems. We say things like, 
We are ravaging ecosystems, which is decimating biodiversity and driving species to extinction. And so what I did for the longest time is I would equate the two. I thought that helping species, biodiversity, and ecosystems meant helping individual animals live better lives. And while it's true that those two things may overlap, they may also not. And crucially, they're very different things. So let me just talk about the concept of species for a second to illustrate what I mean. The narrative I used to believe about species is that if a species is thriving, that's a good thing. And if a species is going extinct, that's a bad thing. But is this necessarily the case? Well, to evaluate, let's do a thought experiment. What if we could ensure the survival of a species forever? but at the expense of the individuals of that species living miserable lives. Would we do it? Well, phrased like that, I hope that we wouldn't. But what's funny is that we've actually already kind of done this. See, if species is the thing to focus on, then chickens are the most successful bird conservation efforts in history. Today, there are about 10 times more of these guys, and there are humans on the planet. We have buildings to keep them safe from the weather and predators, buildings to help them breed, buildings to safely hatch their eggs, trucks to shuttle them in between these different buildings. I mean, chickens have gotten humans to collaborate on a massive scale, spend billions of dollars and countless hours creating this worldwide industry, in essence, to keep them in existence forever. So from a species perspective, they're doing even better than us. But from the individual's perspective, they're not doing so well. The vast majority of them live on factory farms, where they've been selectively bred to grow so fast, they reach the size of a large adult by the time they're about six weeks old, which is when we kill them. Now, for perspective, I did the math, and in a human context, that would be as if we bred a human to grow to the size of a large adult by the time they're about five years old. And because they grow so fast, their organs and joints sometimes can't keep up, which leads them to have problems doing the most basic things, like standing, walking, and even breathing. So from a species perspective, they're doing fantastic. But from the individual's perspective, they're doing horrible. So horrible that they're probably better off being extinct. The thing with species, biodiversity, and ecosystems is that unlike individuals, those things don't have thoughts, consciousness. They don't suffer. They're abstract concepts that humans have invented to describe the world, but no animal in the entire world wakes up thinking about or worrying about these things. No dog in the entire world wakes up on a fluffy velvet pillow in a two-bedroom apartment in the middle of a metropolitan city and mourns the fact that there's not more biodiversity or natural ecosystem around them. They're just like, so you're just going like, to stare at me or you throw in that ball? Like, what are we? Can I have belly rub? Like, what, what, what are we doing here? We get to decide what's important to us. And if what is important is the well-being of individuals, the way that we should think about species, biodiversity, and ecosystems is that if helping and protecting those things help create better lives for individuals, let's go for it. But if not, we should be okay with that. And a great story to illustrate this point is the story of Marius the giraffe. So Marius was a giraffe who lived in Copenhagen Zoo, and he was famously euthanized on the 9th of February 2014. What happened is that a zookeeper led him out onto a yard and offered him a piece of rye bread, a snack he was particularly fond of, and he said, here you go, Marius, here is some rye bread. And as Marius bowed his head down to eat the rye bread, a vet stood behind him and shot him with a rifle. So the question is why? Why did they do this? Was it because Marius was sick and suffering? No, in fact, he was perfectly healthy. Was it because he was getting old, maybe? No, this was three days after his second birthday. Was it because he was aggressive and dangerous? No, he was as agreeable as a giraffe can be. 
The reason why they killed Marius was because he was a part of the zoo's captive breeding program. Now, the point of the captive breeding program is to ensure that species survive for as long as possible. And what they did is they looked at Marius's genes and they determined that his genes were not helpful in achieving that goal. In other words, they killed Marius because he had nothing to contribute to his species. Now, I don't know what was going on in the minds of the people who made all the decisions, but I'm guessing that they would say that they were there to help animals and that they had good intentions. But their actions show that what they meant by helping animals is not, let's ensure that individual animals have the best lives possible. It was, how do we ensure that the species survives for as long as possible? And so the worth of Marius's life was predicated not on how he was an individual with thoughts, feelings, a fondness for rye bread, the capacity to suffer, and the potential to live a happy life. It was predicated on how useful, or in this case, useless, he was to his species. This is the kind of thinking that permeates our conversations about animals. Think back to the image of the sea turtle, the koala, or the polar bear. What's striking about their stories is that a part of the narrative is always that these animals are endangered. Open the newspaper, read the story about them, what does it say? Sea turtle hurts by plastic straw, such a shame because they're endangered. Koala burns alive in a bushfire, such a shame because they're endangered. Polar bear starves in the Arctic, such a shame because they're endangered. It implies that perhaps that the fact that an animal is suffering on its own is not enough for us to want to report on them. And sure enough, there are lots of animals who die in bushfires. We only ever hear about the ones who are endangered. Now, sea turtles, koalas, and polar bears, even giraffes, are lucky because for one reason or another, humans have decided we like those animals. And so even though we may partly value them for how they're endangered, or maybe we think their lives are a little bit extra valuable, a bit more, we also value them as individuals. However, not every animal is so fortunate. So take fish, for example. When it comes to fish, the issue that's on everyone's mind is overfishing. And overfishing is the idea that we're taking too many fish out of the ocean so that fish populations can't sustainably recover. And this thing is an ecological disaster. It's a threat to species, biodiversity, and ecosystems. And while we talk a lot about this issue, a perspective that's never really represented is the perspective of the individual. I mean, when we see videos of these huge fishing nets emerging out of the water, filled to the brim with fish, it paints the picture of how we're emptying the ocean and how that's tragic. But no one ever asks, what would it be like to be one of those fish? Because fish and the fishing industry suffer immensely. If you were one of those fish in one of those nets, and you're taken out of the water, you would suffocate and get crushed under the weight of all the other fish at the same time. And you would die in a horrific way, maybe by being put on ice or having your gills cut. When we mourn the death of fish, not because they're individuals who suffered, but simply because of the impact their deaths have on species and ecosystems, we're doing to them what the Copenhagen Zoo did to Marius. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about something happy for once in my life. I want to talk to you about these three cats that I'm very, very close to who live with my girlfriend's parents. Their names are Lacey, Alice, and Yuki. So Lacey is a lap cat. She'll do this thing where I'll be sitting at my computer doing some work, She'll come right up, look up at me with the most adorable kitten eyes, and then she'll meow. But she kind of sounds like a chipmunk. So it's kind of like, ah. And then she'll jump on my lap and stay there the entire day, won't even let me go to the bathroom. Now, Alice has never done anything like that. 
but she'll do this thing where she grooms me. And what I mean by that is she'll come right up to my face and she'll lick my eyebrows and my hair. And I also have no idea why she does this, but if you've been wondering why my brows look so good, now you know. And Yuki shows no affection. Or I guess I should say that she doesn't show any affection to me. She's the only indoor-outdoor cat, and what she'll do, though, is she'll come to me, get my attention, walk me to the door, stand there expecting me to open the door for her, which I always do. She walks out, I close the door, that's what our friendship looks like, and I'm pretty sure her love language is acts of service. Now, these three cats have vastly different personalities. And if you personally know dogs or cats, this is no surprise to you. Of course they do, they're different individuals. But when we overlook the individual's perspective, we sometimes forget this about other animals. I remember the first time that I recognized this about chickens. I was at this wildlife rescue and sanctuary in Singapore called Acres, and I met these two chickens whose names were Diggle and Dumpling. Now, I've met chickens before, but typically I've met them in farms. And if you look inside a chicken farm today, what you see is an ocean of chickens, tens of thousands of chickens in a huge barn. And from afar, they all look the same. I mean, they're just chickens, right? But when I met Diggle and Dumpling, I realized how mistaken I was, because they were just so different from each other. I mean, Diggle was a social butterfly. Or I guess technically he was a social chicken, but the point is, He's the kind of guy who would come right up to you, eat food out of your hands, look at you up close, peck your clothes. But Dumpling was extremely shy. He's the type of guy that you would take one step towards him, and he'd just get out of there. It really reminds me of what would happen when I'd approach women in a bar. When it comes to the climate crisis, I think it's important for us to remember what, or should I say, who is important? I think it's important that we remember that at the end of the day, the climate crisis is a problem because it causes suffering to individuals, human and non-human. And whether an animal is a sea turtle in the ocean, a giraffe in a zoo, a cat at home, a chicken in a factory farm, or a fish in the ocean, their life their suffering matters to them. And shouldn't that be the only reason we need to care about them too? Thank you very much.